So let me uh, share my screen here. This meeting's being recorded. Continue. I agree. Um, let me share my screen here. Okay, can everybody see my screen? Yes. Looks good, yeah. Awesome, good. So uh, now that the te technology fear is over, um, I think this is a really good opportunity for us to thank the organizers of this conference. Uh, it's been a wonderful conference so far. It's the um, last talk that we'll all be together at once. And uh, so I'd like to especially acknowledge uh, Rodika Kostin, uh, Jim Fowler, John Johnson, and Liz Vivas for their tremendous work that they've done to make this a success. I've really enjoyed it so far and I can just see how much everybody's enjoyed it. So um, if we dare risk breaking the internet, maybe we can unmute ourselves for a minute and, uh, and clap. Uh, I know it's against the rules to unmute ourselves too much, but um, we will try. Um, Thanks. So, <laughs> so hopefully can everybody, and everybody can see my iPad, okay. Um, Good. And uh, it's, just been, uh, it's just been amazing to hear your talks. I've enjoyed asking many of you questions and uh, thanks for the thumbs up, John. Um, and uh, it's been wonderful. I've, I've truly enjoyed every bit of it. So um, this talk here, my goal is to show you some really cool math problems, including some open problems and to have fun. This talk should be fun. Math is supposed to be fun. So um, in particular, uh, I plan to explain a little bit about rational and irrational rotations of the circle. This is very old math. This is 1916 math, say, okay? Then I'll tell you about the three gaps theorem. This is kind of the main theorem of the talk, or maybe the first theorem of the talk. This is 1950s math. It's pretty awesome, but it's still 1950s math. So then I'll go on and mention some applications of the three gaps theorem. And one of these applications, application to the quantum harmonic oscillator, uh, that actually motivates a higher dimensional version of the three gaps theorem. The higher dimensional version is a theorem of uh, Boschernitsen and Dyson, and uh, it was proved in 1991. So that's actually becoming modern mathematics. You might disagree. You were probably born after 1991. I wasn't. Um, however, I consider that to be modern mathematics. If you um, don't consider that modern, I will also try to talk about the frequencies with which the gaps occur. And that is truly modern. That is 2010 through present. And I want to highlight work that a group of three high school students did uh, with Pavel Blaher from my department and myself uh, back in 2010 and tell you what they did on this problem. So it's a student project. So um, as you know, and I've seen you doing wonderfully during the uh, other talks, please ask me questions inter in, and interact as much as possible. I like questions. If there aren't any questions, something's wrong. Um, and also you can email me. I'm very happy to hear from you by email. Um, after the talk or whenever, uh, just communicate and I'm happy to discuss. So let's get started. So um, let's let S1 denote the unit circle. And uh, we're not gonna measure the circle angles on the circle in terms of radians or degrees. We're gonna measure them in terms of turns. And so one, an angle of one, one turn will bring you all the way around the circle back to where you started. That'll just avoid having to write two pi's constantly. So let's do that. And I'm gonna take some angle omega and some natural number n, and I'll, I'll compute this sequence of points in the circle, omega mod n, mod one, I'm sorry, two omega mod one, three omega mod one, et cetera, et cetera, until I get to n omega mod one. This will be a collection of points on the circle. If n's big, it could be a lot of different points in the circle. And I'm gonna see what happens. So the best thing to do is to show some videos. And uh, I have a high school student, Anish Dasgupta, who's working with me this summer, and hopefully longer, and uh, he made some nice videos for me and for us. So let me try to show you these videos. The first video I show will be of a rational angle rotation. Omega is rational. In fact, omega is 17 over 53. It's kind of a complicated rational number. And the second video will be omega is square root of two. So let me attempt to show the videos. So here is the rational rotation of the circle by angle 17 over 53 turns. The green line is angle zero. The blue line is the first point, omega mod one. So I'll do this for like 20 points.
filling out the circle nicely. And then after a while, it basically looks like nothing's happening. And that's expected because the angle's rational. Okay, let me show you the irrational rotation. This is by angle square root of two. So here is zero again. Here is square root of two turns, which mod one, which means it's really 0 0.41, etc. mod one, because we've dropped the one. Everybody can see these videos, right? Thumbs up? Yes. All right, yeah, cool. <laughs> Make sure I'm not talking to myself, <laughs> which happens sometimes. All right, so here we go. Uh, so we're creating this set of points on the circle, and it looks almost the same as what we were doing before. But notice that it's not stabilizing. It's not stabilizing because our angle is irrational. Okay, does anybody want to see those again or are we ready to move forward? Maybe we'll move forward, but I, I want you to interact. If you want to see something again, just tell me. So um, let me go back to my iPad here. Um, Hi, Roland. There's a, there's a question in the chat about awesome. um, basically using tau base radians. Using, okay, let me, let me open the chat to see if I can. Uh, using what kind of radians? Uh, uh, tau, tau base radians. Tau. What, which tau? Hannah, which tau are you talking about? I, I suspect they mean the tau for 2 pi. Ah, okay. Um, so I, I'm just imagining if you like, instead of choosing omega, I could be choosing omega times 2 pi, but I don't want to write 2 pi constantly. So I'd rather just do everything in terms of one. So I'm just going to imagine that the length of the circle is one unit. And so, so if I rotate by square root of two, I go all the way around the circle for the one, and then I go 0 0.41, et cetera, further. Uh, did that answer your question? Yeah, cool. Awesome. Thank you very much. OK, so um, here we go. And um, so as I said in the rational case, it's very boring. What happens is that for a sufficiently large n, you just get the points 0, 1 over q, 2 over q, through q minus 1 over q. They don't appear in that order. Um, so somebody explained what the tau manifesto is. I'll look at that later. I, I read manifestos uh, not when speaking. Um, so, uh, so you just get these finitely many points in the circle. You don't get them in that particular order. As you saw, they kind of appeared at various times. But eventually, you fill out these evenly spaced finite collection of points. If uh, omega is irrational, then it turns out that if you take all of the points, if you let m, your integer times omega, vary over every natural number, you get a dense set of points on the circle. And that's actually a fun thing to think about. Um, if you've never thought about that, it's an actually an application of the uh, pigeonhole principle. So um, you can think about that now or you can think about that later, but it's a cool thing. So if it's a dense set of points, you might think there's not much left to say. However, there are some very interesting local properties about the distances between the pairs of points. So that's where I'm going. And um, so here's our sequence again, omega mod one to omega mod one through omega mod one up through n omega mod one. I'm going to stop at n. I'm not going to go infinitely far. I'll just stop at some finite n. And then I'll make n bigger and bigger and see what happens. But for some finite n, I'm going to make that collection of points. Now, they probably don't appear on the circle in the order omega, 2 omega, 3 omega, et cetera, mod 1, they probably appear in some other order. So let me just relabel these points according to the order they appear on the circle. So I'm going to actually illustrate this construction in a minute. I'll, I'll write on, I'll have a circle, I'll draw everything, I'll write on everything. But we're going to reorder the points as y1, y2, et cetera, through yn. Now, what we're interested in is the distances between neighboring points. So you take the Pairs of closest points, say yj, yj plus 1, or here I've got yk, yk minus 1, and these are going to be called the gaps or the spacings. Throughout the talk, I'll try to call them gaps, but I may relapse and call them spacings. So these are the spacings, and these are kind of the local structure of how these points are distributed on the circle. And they have some very interesting properties, and this, this whole talk is about spacings or gaps. Okay? Now, it could happen that maybe 
two or more of your spacings or gaps have the same length. It could happen that a hundred of them have the same length. So if you want to, you could just list the possible different gap lengths that are obtained. And I want to call those capital delta one, capital delta two, through capital delta D of N. And there's a question, why do we need to write mod one? Yeah, so, so it's like writing angles mod two pi on the circle. Um, the point is like, you know, when you're teaching kids how to do math, you say, okay, angle, you know, 540 degrees or whatever, you really mean 540 degrees mod 360. So it's just a being more formal. I'm not working with a kind of universal cover where the angles can be any real number. I'm, I'm trying to discuss them on the circle. Did that answer your question, Jacob? Yes, thank you. Awesome. I like all of your questions and the other talks too. This is great. Um, okay, so let me show everybody what I'm trying to talk about. Now, just before that though, if the sequence of points plotted on the circle were just completely random, say uniform, saying identically distributed and independently, then you'd expect to have n different distances between pairs of points. You expect totally no, no relationship between the distances. Okay, so uh, here's an example. This is omega is square root of two n is 10, so that it's not, not, too, uh, not too complicated. And so here we go. This point is y1, even though that's not the first point that appears. The first point that appeared was like over here. This was square root of two mod one. This point is y2, y3. This point is y4, y5, y6, y7, y8 y9, and y10, okay? So we're just ordering them on the circle. And then um, I'm gonna be interested in the uh, spacings between these. So the first spacing here is this length here. This is delta one. So this is y1 plus one, because you're going around through zero minus y10. This here is delta two, delta three, delta four, delta five, delta six, delta seven, delta eight, delta nine, and delta 10. I'm not marking the arcs because uh, time is precious. And um, okay, is everybody happy with that so far? No complaint yep. means no, uh, no unhappiness. Um, <laughs> so now let's look at this. It looks like some of these lengths are the same. For example, if you look at the shortest intervals, it looks like delta two is probably the same as delta four. If you look at delta two, it looks like it's probably the same as delta four, and that's probably the same as delta six, that's probably the same as delta eight, and that's probably the same as delta 10. Now from the graph, of course, you couldn't tell that because I mean exactly equal, not approximately equal, but let's just suppose that that's the case. So let's say this is our shortest, distinct length delta one is little delta one, oops, sorry, two equals little delta four equals little delta six equals little delta eight equals little delta 10. So that's the shortest of the lengths, okay? And then if you go and find some other lengths, maybe the second shortest is uh, this delta three, which is the same as this delta five, it looks like, which is the same as delta nine, then you've got Delta two, capital delta two is delta three, which is delta five, which is delta nine. And then there's two left, which are the biggest spacings. And uh, maybe we'll do them in green. There is delta one, which looks like it's the same as delta seven. Now, as I said, this is just, we don't know the theorem yet, so we don't know that these would be equal, but it looks like it could be. So let me say delta three, is delta one, which is delta seven. So it looks like even though there are 10 different gaps, like there are really only three different gap lengths. So this is a good place to be sure that everybody's with me because uh, this construction occurs constantly throughout the talk. Everybody cool? Questions, comments, concerns, complaints? All right, cool. So. Um, let me just do another example. I'm not going to write everything here because it's going to look, it's going to be too long, but it sure looks like uh, we have a delta so one is the shortest, about, right? Question, yeah, yeah doing good. Like choosing, choosing N 
where, where, why n equals 10 n equals 20 ah because those are nice numbers um so <laughs> i i in the end then the name of the game is going to be to take n bigger and bigger and bigger so i i, I kind of want to take n equals one then n equals two then n equals three and just do do this construction for every possible n and then gradually take n to infinity and see what happens. But uh, 10 was small enough that I could do everything by hand easily. 20 is a little bit bigger, so it's kind of more convincing. Did, did I answer your question? Yes, thank you. Cool, yeah. It's hard to see who's talking, so it's a, a little bit daunting. Um, so it looks like we have several of these kind of smallest gaps. And then it looks like we've got kind of a, let's see, um, the next smallest gaps look like this one here, perhaps, delta 2, delta 2. Did I miss any delta 2s? Looks OK. Maybe. Is, is that delta 2 on the far left, the delta 1 instead? Mm -hmm. Uh, on the far left, mm, I labeled one delta of the two in green. Ah, yes, I'm sorry. You're right. Uh, j just making sure. Let me, uh, no, no, that's good. Let me figure out how to erase. I just upgraded good notes, so I don't know how to erase, which is kind of sad. Um, <laughs> let me just make this a, oh, oops. Let me just make this a one. I'll just write over it. Oh, this is too fancy for me. Um, this is supposed to be a one, OK? So um, eh, I see what the problem is. OK. And then we have some delta 3s, which I'll write them in purple or something. This is a delta 3. This is a delta 3. This is a delta 3. Now that my pen's working again, I can make that a 1. Uh, this is a delta 3. This is a delta 3. That's a delta 3. That's a delta 3. This is a delta 3. And this here, going through 0, is a delta 3. That makes sense. Now the idea was that n is supposed to be big enough that it's a little bit surprising that we only have three lengths, but not so big that we spend an hour just labeling them. All right, so um, here we go. Uh, let me go to the theorem. So uh, Hugo Steinhaus uh, conjectured that no matter what omega is, for any n n could be a billion, n could be five. For any n, there are only three different capital delta lengths. Okay. And in the late 1950s, uh, it was proved independently this fact by Vera Sos, Janos Siriani, and Stanislaw Swierkowski. So uh, Vera Sos's name has come up in a couple of the other talks. So she's um, also involved in this game. So this is now called the uh, three gaps theorem gap theorem. So there's Vera Sos on the left, uh, Janos Suryani in the middle, and Stanislaw Swierkowski on the right. Now, it's unfortunate I should have been able to find younger pictures of them for the Young Mathematicians Conference, especially because uh, Sos and Swierkowski proved this in their late 20s. And so they were actually young mathematicians when they proved this. Older than you, but maybe eight or nine years older than you. So this really is a young mathematician's theorem. And I find this to be an amazingly beautiful theorem. It's very, it, it's very surprising. And you'll see the proof is very simple when you think about it just right. Any questions on the statement? Cool. All right. So let us try to prove it. So there's a proof from uh, 1979 that's like the proof from the book as uh, we heard from uh, Matthew's talk yesterday, there's a notion of proofs from the book. This is the proof from the book for the three gaps theorem. And uh, there's really two cases. There's a question. Is it possible to have irrational omega with less than three gaps? So you can have, for an irrational omega, you can have for a certain n, you can have two gaps. But you will always have some arbitrarily large values of n when you have three gaps. Kind of typical situation is to have three gaps. There are some very special ends when you just have two. So um, I'm going to do the 
proof from the book, but only in the case that omega is irrational. That's the harder case. But um, I'm going to use the irrationality at some point. Yeah, cool. Um, so I'm going to use the irrationality at some point in the proof. So we're going to use the cyclic ordering of these points in the circle. So I'm going to I'm going to wrap around and say that um, y y n is less than y one. So we we do the full circular ordering, and um, I'm going to consider an interval y k y k plus one, one of these gap intervals between the nearest neighbor points, and if you rotate it by omega, it may or may not again be a gap interval. So let me show you on a picture. Um, if you if you rotate this little tiny gap interval here, this is some sort of delta k. If you rotate it, it goes to some other gap interval. So delta k can be rotated, can be rotated to another gap interval. However, um, if I take a different one, maybe this one here, maybe this is delta L, if you try to rotate delta L by omega, then you go again and you end up somewhere over here. And there's no, no short interval. So the, um, the gap intervals that cannot be rotated by omega to another gap interval are called rigid. There's a long question. Oof. Book by Steinhaus for Children, 100 Problems. So, <laughs> yeah, so I mean, I don't know if it's a real research problem or not, but um, it's a nice problem. But I will get to something that's truly research, I promise you. So this is great. I love the interaction. It's making my day much more funny. Um, OK, so is everybody clear what a rigid gap is? It's a gap interval that when you rotate it by your rotation omega, it stops being a gap interval another chat thing. If they don't tell you, then you don't believe it's impossible and you prove it. Yeah, that's right. All right, so um, good. So let's go on to the next step. And so I claim that if you have a gap interval that's not rigid, meaning that you can rotate it by omega and get another gap interval, then after finitely many of these rotations by omega, it has to become rigid. You cannot keep rotating it infinitely many times. Okay, here's the reason. The reason is, well, the circle has finite length. It has length one. And so if you kept rotating your non-rigid gap interval and never landed on a rigid one, you could keep going and going. Since the circle has finite length, it has to land back exactly on where you started. So here we've landed exactly back on where we've started. So this is the rotated one, and we landed back on where we started, okay? Well, but that implies, because then you have Q omega here and zero there, that implies that Q omega is P because you're doing mod one. Q omega is P for some integer P, which would imply that omega is P over Q. But that implies that omega is rational and we are in the irrational case of the proof. So basically, if you have a gap interval and if you can rotate it around by omega finitely many times and land exactly back where you started, that means that your rotation was a rational rotation. But we're not doing that. So therefore, if you have any non-rigid gap interval, you can only rotate it finitely many times until you have to eventually land on a rigid one. You have to stop. All right. Conclusion is awesome. The conclusion is that the number of distinct gap lengths is less than or equal to the number of rigid gap intervals. Because if you have any gap length, any gap of some length, you can always rotate it finitely many times until you land on a rigid one of the same length. All right. So how can a gap interval be rigid? Um, we had a rigid one here. This one was rigid. And this one rotated over to here. It rotated to some place like this. Let me try to draw it. It rotated something like this. And the problem was this point here 
is not of the form k omega mod 1 with 1 less than or equal to k less than or equal to n. This point is exactly, in fact, this point here is exactly, um, this point here is exactly n plus 1 omega mod 1. So when you try to rotate that little rigid gap interval, it's no longer, the rotated version is no longer a gap interval because it's missing an endpoint. So this is kind of a missing endpoint here, okay? Everybody see that? Similarly, um, if you took this one here, this gap interval here, if you rotate it, it goes to here. And again, this time the uh, further endpoint is missing. So we have two different gap intervals here that are rigid. Um, this one's also rigid. So we have two rigid gap intervals because you rotate them by omega and there's an endpoint that's missing. Missing endpoint. Okay. That makes sense, everybody? Cool. You can have the opposite problem. You can also have a gap interval like this one here, where when you rotate it by omega. Oh, is it there's a yeah, question in the question. chat. Thank you. Cool. Yes, it says, uh, what, do you, what do you mean by missing endpoint? Ah, so what I mean, let me, let me try to draw it. Um, let's take this gap interval here, OK? And then if I try to rotate that, I rotate it to there. But this endpoint here is exactly n plus 1 omega mod 1. So that's a point that we are not using to form our, our gaps. So, so really, really this black interval is rotating to become a sub-interval of this bigger purple, purple interval. So it doesn't rotate to another gap interval because it rotates to be a subset of a bigger one. Did that answer your question, Jacob? Yeah. Yeah, and somebody, uh, Marino has a question. Ah, relations between the, okay, so let me look at Marino's question. So, Asked so late, but does the circle having finite length give us that we rotate? Yeah, so um, for Marino's question, each of the rotations of the intervals, if you take an interval and keep rotating it around, um, if you can keep rotating it, it couldn't land just halfway across another one because then it would not be rigid because you'd have a point in between. So if Sorry, then it, then it would be rigid because it would be split. So, so if, if you rotate it around, as you rotate, if it's never rigid, as you rotate, they have to be disjoint. And so then the length of uh, j rotations of it is j times the length of the interval, and that goes to infinity. But the length of the circle is finite, and so, so you can't do that. So ho hopefully that answers Marino's question. And Hannah asks, cool. And Hannah asks, are there any relations? Yes. So I'm not going to prove it for you, but I was going to mention later in the talk, the um, longest length, delta, capital delta three, is the sum of the two smaller lengths. So um, there's only so much I can prove uh, in this talk uh, because of time and I want to get to the higher dimensional version, but I, I love your questions. Um, okay, so the other possible problem is you can have a gap interval like this one. This one was actually delta one. And if you rotate it, it rotates to here. Let me just call it delta one plus omega. And the problem is there is this guy right here that splits it, splits delta one plus omega. Ah. It splits delta one plus omega. So when you rotate delta one plus omega, suddenly there's a new point that's smacked in the middle of it. So you rotate it as no longer a gap interval because it's a union of two gap intervals, not one. So that's the other way that you can have a rigid gap interval. So this delta one is also rigid. And the claim is that there are only three rigid gap intervals 
And then by our logic from the previous slide, that will show that d of t is less than or equal to three. That, that'll be the proof. And if you want to follow through the logic for that, if you let um, capital Y be the set of all points that we're using to form our gap intervals, <clears throat> there are only two ways a gap interval could be rigid. One is that if you rotate, I should make this a different color, if you rotate by omega, it could be that one of the two endpoints, either this one or this one, might not be in Y. That was the first case we saw when you rotated, and your rotated interval was a subinterval of one that was too big. The other possibility is that both endpoints of the rotated interval could be in Y, but they're not consecutive. That would mean that you rotate, and your rotated interval is actually a union of two intervals. There's some point of Y in the middle. That was the other case here. This was this case here. The first case was here. The second case was here. Okay, and so. Case one can only happen if either yk or yk plus one, if either of the two endpoints of your interval is the last point n omega mod one of our sequence. And you can see that here. This is the n omega mod one. This is the last point. And these two rigid intervals were the ones that had that as one of their endpoints. And then you rotate, and this is n plus one omega mod one, which is missing. And there, therefore, these two rigid intervals are rotating to be proper subintervals of a gap interval, but not equal to one. Okay. And so there are exactly two such intervals that have n omega mod one as an endpoint. The other possibility is that there's a point y inside of your rotated interval that's in y. And that can only happen if y minus omega mod one is not in y. Said differently, that can only happen if y is omega or if your gap interval is centered around zero. So there's only one such gap interval. So you know, two plus one equals three, and we're done. Okay, everybody believe the proof? Nice. It could be a trick question. You've noticed that I've got a sense of humor, but uh, I believe this proof is actually correct. Um, awesome. So that took longer than I expected, but um, I think it was great to have so much interaction. So let me mention some of the applications um, in science and nature, as I said in the abstract. So um, some people from phylotaxis, the study of plant growth, have used the three gap theorem to talk about the um, possible angles between petals. So this would be like delta one, or maybe, maybe this one, maybe that would be delta two, this would be delta one, et cetera. Some people in music theory have discussed an old version of tuning called Pythagorean tuning is not the classical, sorry, it's not the modern version. They've used the three gap theorem. What I consider to be a much more serious application is the two dimensional quantum harmonic oscillator. So the uh, harmonic oscillator is just a mass at the end of a spring moving back and forth. If you consider the quantum version, maybe the mass is infinitesimally small, um, the energy levels are basically some ground state energy plus an integer after you rescale things suitably. But if you have two different masses with two different springs, then there is some sort of constant you can't remove from your getting rid of your getting rid of your constants. So the energies are the ground state energy plus an integer plus another integer times omega, where omega is some kind of ratio from the spring constants. And that omega forces you to study the three gap problem. And that forces you into a situation that was studied by Barry and Tabor. They have a very influential paper that's one of the first papers on quantum chaos. The quantum harmonic oscillators, the quantum non-chaos, but they still study about a third of their paper on that. Also by Blaher and Dyson and, and others. Now, this is a very pure math, math conference and I'm kind of relieved because I'm not an expert in these applications. But let me mention that the quantum harmonic oscillator business, um, the two dimensional quantum harmonic oscillator is nothing special about two. You could have the n dimensional quantum harmonic oscillator. So that application generalizes to higher dimensions. And that's where I want to go next. So the question is, is there a version of the three gap theorem and a version of the problem that the theorem addresses in higher dimensions? And so, let me describe for you the setup of the problem. So you fix a dimension d, 
And the vector omega, instead of having one number omega, you have a d-dimensional vector omega 1 through omega d. And what we're going to do is we're going to take a region. I'm going to have a cartoon picture of this in a minute. We're going to take a region r, a bounded convex region in r to the d. And for any t greater than 0, we're just going to scale r by a factor of t. So like a blob that you scale by t. Okay. Then you take the integer points in that blob of size t. These are the points that have integer coordinates. And you consider the points, you consider the values on the circle, integer vector m from capital M dot omega mod 1 on the circle. Or if you like, you can spell out what the uh, dot product is. You take m1 omega 1 plus m2 omega 2 all the way through md omega d mod 1, where m is any vector in this blob of integer vector points in r to the d. So if, if d was 1, you would just have m omega, m1 omega 1, which would be the one-dimensional problem that we just discussed. And your blob would just be an interval, which you might as well think is like 0 to n, which is what we were doing before. So you make this set of points, it's a finite set of points on the circle, and then you order them just like we did before. You take the smallest one, the second smallest one, up through the biggest one. The biggest one is uh, there are cardinality of m of t such points. You order them. You consider the distances between nearest neighbors exactly like before, but now there are between 2 and m of t of these. I'm going to ignore the one that wraps through 0 just to keep things simple. It's not going to matter for our discussion, but this, I'm cheating you slightly by getting rid of that one. So you've got these nearest neighbor distances, or these gaps, and um, then you can list the distinct values that are obtained, exactly as before. So the only difference from what we did before is that instead of considering just the integers 1 through n, times a single number omega taken mod one, we consider a blob in R to the D and we take any integer, any point with integer coordinates in that blob, we dot product that with our vector omega, that's a real number, take it mod one, that's a point on the circle. So then you get some finite number of distinct values, uh, capital delta one through capital delta D of T. So I think the cartoon is really necessary. Um, so here is R of T is this blue blob, in this case, it's the circle of radius two, the disk of radius two. I've drawn the points with integer coordinates in the plane here, um, z2. And um, what we're doing is for every integer point in this blob, in this case, it's just r, like this magenta point here, we take that point, we take its coordinates m1, m2, and we dot with omega mod one that gives you some point on the circle. And then we're going to do that for every other point, each of the, I think there are like 12 points in this blue blob R of 1. But then we start scaling the blob, the blue blob, and do this for more and more integer points determined by which integer points are in R of t, the blue blob scaled by t. So here's a bigger blob. You do the same thing, you get more points on the circle. It's not really a sequence until you order them by the angle on the circle. And the question is about the statistics of these gaps between the points. How many are there and what can you say about them? Is that kind of clear what the problem is supposed to be? Does that make sense, everybody? Cool. I see at least one thumbs up, two, okay. And probably maybe there are some others. That, they don't have a thumbs down button, do they? Okay, so, uh, so I want to show you a video. The video is not going to be super enlightening, but maybe it's good to have a video. Um, Hi, Roland, there's a question yeah. in the chat. Uh, okay, give me, just a one... give, give me just a second. I want to get the video up while I'm thinking about that, then, I, then I'll... Uh, Google Chrome, yes. Okay, give me one more second. Ah. I'm just going to get to the video I want, and then I, I will answer the question. So um, let me just try to find the chat. Or, or uh, John, do you want to read me the question? Uh, sure. The question was, uh, are both omega-1 and omega-2 irrational? Yes, that is a great question. And I'm going to answer that in one minute. 
but you, you, can, you can imagine that they are. My favorite example will be cube root of two, cube root of four. And that's the example that I'll be doing in this video. So here's the video. Can everybody see my video? Yeah. Yes. Cool. So here we go. It looks almost the same as before, but if you stop it at some point like here, it looks to me like maybe there are more than three gap lengths already. What do you think? Short, second shortest, third shortest, fourth shortest maybe. It looks like more than three to me. Okay. So here we're taking a uh, n by n square and scaling it up. Okay, so hopefully um, that makes sense. Let me go to my iPad. Okay, hold on, there's a, oh no, there's not another question. There's a, yeah, there's another question. Uh, let me go to my iPad first. Okay. This is good practice for teaching online. I haven't taught online for like three months, so it's very tricky for me. Um, I got to figure out how to get the chat window back. So there was a question. What do I mean by missing endpoint? So, uh, no, that wasn't the latest one. Um, why do we always take our regions to be about the origin? It doesn't really matter, but the point is that you can always do some shift to suppose it's about the origin. So if, you, if you're scaling it up, uh, because the, you're looking at the differences between the points, um, the, the nearest neighbor distances or the gaps. So you might as well suppose it's centered at the origin. Okay, so, um, so let me boldly continue um, as you're supposed to do in life. So the question is, uh, under what conditions on the vector omega is the number of distinct gap lengths bounded? And this is a great question. And so here is a simulation for um, omega is cube root of two, cube root of four, and r of t is the t by t square. And then you can see the number of gap lengths for t between zero and 100. Another question, Ella. Since you're ignoring the zero point case, does placing it matter if we don't? Zero point case. Oh, you mean, you mean where is the angle zero? Um, yeah, it, it probably doesn't matter. But l let, me, um, let me say probably, and I'll, I'll move forward with my talk, and then if you insist, I'll answer you later. Um, so uh, if you take the limit as the radius, measure the boundary goes to infinity, does something cool happen? So, so Hannah, do you mean like the, as the number of points goes to infinity? Yeah, that's, that's the name of the game. And something cool is going to happen, um, hopefully. But I realize that my time is like uh, dissipating extremely fast. So let me try to get to something awesome. So, um, so here is a, no, oh, it's cool, it's fine. Uh, I like the interaction. So here it looks like D of T might be bounded by eight. So to tell you the theorem, um, I need to tell you a little bit about notions of irrationality for irrational numbers beyond just rational or irrational. So there's a su subject in number theory called Diophantine approximation. And there's a great theorem, Dirichlet's approximation theorem. It tells you that for any alpha real number, that there exist infinitely many rational numbers, p over q, that approximated at least as close as one over q squared. So you can always approximate any real number alpha pretty well with an error of one over q squared. You always quantify how good your approximation is by how big of a denominator you have. Big denominators are bad when you're approximating. Okay, and it's funny, for some real numbers, you can't do any better. So there's a notion of a badly approximable number alpha, and a number alpha is badly approximable if there is a constant k greater than zero, so that your alpha minus your approximation p over q is always greater than k over q squared. So it could be that, of course, you can always do this at least as well as one over q squared, but maybe you can't do it as well as one half over q squared. So that's a so-called badly approximable number. And it's a funny thing, it's a refinement of the notion of an irrational number. And so 
I'm not going to prove it for you, but square root of two is badly approximable. You cannot do better than one over q squared for any, or better than k over q squared for any q. However, the famous Liouville number, the sum of 10 to the minus n factorial, is not badly approximable, but it is irrational. The reason is if you sum it up finitely far, the next terms are so small relative to your finite sum that your finite sum is an extremely good approximation of it. And this is how Liouville proved that, uh, that there are transcendental numbers, because any algebraic number has to be uh, better approximable than this. So. All right, so I'm going kind of fast because of time. Now I want to talk about badly approximable vectors. And I'm going to use the notion for a real number x. I'm going to use the norm notation, the double vertical line notation, for its distance to the integers. This is just what people in the subject use. And for any vector in r to the d, I'm just going to use single lines for the Euclidean norm. And uh, you know, maybe you want to switch which is which, but this is the convention, so it is, it is what it is. A vector omega in r to the d is badly approximable if there is a constant k greater than zero, so that for every non-zero ve integer vector omega, so you've got your non-zero integer vector, sorry, integer vector m, I meant to say, m dot omega distance to the integers is no smaller than k over the length of m to the d. So you might read this better as saying that the perpendicular subspace of r to the d, the subspace perpendicular to omega, is hard to approximate by integer vectors. That's kind of how you, if you look at it skeptically, that's how you read it. But that's kind of the same as what we were doing before in the one-dimensional case. Uh, if you think about this when d is one, you can trace this back and it'll be the same definition as on the previous slide. But basically it's saying you cannot find an integer vector that dots with omega to give you a number close to an integer, say zero, um, without making the length of m extremely large. Everybody happy with that? Cool. All right. So, um, okay, so that's what I just said, basically. And there's a theorem analogous to the Dirichlet approximation theorem. There's a theorem of Minkowski that implies that this is the uh, kind of the strongest you can assume that you can always approximate at least this well, but maybe with a different k. All right, so you can check that 2 to the 1 third, 4 to the 1 third is a badly approximable vector. Um, there's a theorem of Perron that I was hoping to mention in the end of my talk that tells you that. So that's an example, and that's the example where we saw that it looked like d of t was bounded by 8. So here is the great theorem of Boschernitsen and Dyson from 1991. Um, there they are, there's Boschernitsen on the left looking very casual, and Dyson looking relatively casual. And the theorem says that if omega is a badly approximable vector, so if it's really, really hard to approximate the perpendicular direction to omega by an integer vector, then there's a uniform bound d naught on the number of distinct gap lengths. So this is the generalization of the three gap theorem to arbitrary dimensions. And in our favorite case, omega is 2 to the 1 3rd, 4 to the 1 th comma, 4 to the 1 3rd from the previous slide. Uh, that is a badly approximable vector, and you might guess that d naught is like 10 or something. It looked like maybe it's even 8 from the previous slides. However, if you trace through the Boschernitz and Dyson proof, their proof only gives you the d naught is about 400. So one open issue in this business is to improve upon these estimates. The estimates are very poor at this level of life. Any questions on the statement of the Boschernitz and Dyson theorem? Is it clear how it's a generalization of the three gap thing? Is there a way to compute D naught? Yes. Um, so if I do the proof for you, I've got to make an executive decision on what I do because I think I've got like three minutes left. John, three minutes, five minutes, negative one. At least uh, uh, 10 minutes or so. 10 minutes or so? Yeah. I oh, life is good. It, okay. Uh, All right. With questions. That's so. awesome. Um, I am so happy. Okay. So, um, so let me, I still need to make an executive decision here. Um, let me try to do the proof, but at warp speed, and that will answer, answer Jacob's question. Okay. 
But basically, you can estimate D naught in terms of the Diophantine constant K. So, so here's the warp speed proof of their theorem. Their theorem is funny because it's pretty easy, except that you use a famous theorem, another famous theorem to prove it. The number of distinct gap lengths is bounded by if you take the difference between the biggest gap and the smallest gap divided by the minimum distance between minimum difference between gap lengths. Well, that quotient estimates the number of gap lengths, except that if that quotient is one, then you could have two gap lengths, so you need to add one. Okay? So really, a good estimate on the number of gap lengths is the smallest minus the largest over the minimum from one to the next plus one. Okay? So since omega is badly approximable, you can write any of these gap lengths, say delta one of t, as a vector m1 in r of t, an integer vector m1 in r of t dot omega minus another integer vector m2 in r of t dot omega. So then m1 minus m2 has length about t on the scale of t. m1 minus m2 dot omega can't be too small because omega is badly approximable. So the difference, m1 minus m2 dot omega, which is this gap length, is bigger than or equal to some constant c1 t to the minus d. And I see that a new question popped up. Number of lattices points inside the circle and d of t. So, um, so the point is that the number of, uh, let, let's just imagine that this thing is two dimensional. The number of lattice points in d of t is on the order of t squared. It's the, essentially the area of d of t. But here, at least when omega is badly approximable, um, sorry, it's not the area of d of t, it's the area of r of t. So you've got area of r of t, which is scaling like t squared if you're in two dimensions points. However, the number of distinct spacings is supposed to be bounded if omega is badly approximable. Did I answer your question? Okay, let, let, let me continue and, uh, and you, you can ask another question if, uh, if you want to. For kind of similar reasoning, using that omega is badly approximable, there's also a constant C2, so that the difference between, between distinct gap lengths is also bounded by C2, t to the minus d. In this case, you've got four different integer vectors in R of t, and delta i is a difference of two of those integer vectors dot omega, Delta i minus one is a difference of two other integer vectors in R of t dot omega. Therefore, this difference here is a sort of a sum slash difference of four different integer vectors in R of t. It's at most like four t in length. And therefore, the, the badly approximable aspect of omega gives you this bound. Okay. Now we have one more thing to bound. We have to bound the length of the biggest gap. And that's where the tricky part comes in. There's a transference theorem of castles is not incredibly difficult. Um, our high school students read it and explained it to us. But basically, I, let me not try to read it explicitly, but it tells you that, well, being badly approximable means you cannot approximate zero very well by taking an integer vector dot omega. And the transference principle says that, well, any alpha on the circle, you can approximate at least as well as you can approximate zero. Somehow it allows you to approximate other points on the circle other than just zero. And if it's hard to approximate zero, that somehow means that your points are very evenly spread out on the circle. And therefore, you can approximate any other point, at least with as good of an exponent. So you get a estimate that the biggest spacing is no bigger than some constant c3 times t to the minus d. And finally, you get your estimate. The t to the minus d's cancel. You get a uniform constant, and that's the proof. So this is fantastic. And not a lot of people know about this transference theorem. So a lot of people know about badly approximable vectors, but the transference theorems are really phenomenal. They're, they're extremely powerful. So I, I recommend them. So um, what I would like to do, uh, there are two options. If I have two minutes left, which is my guess, I would like to maybe describe what my Pavel Blecher and my high school students did, um, but I want to describe it extremely quickly. The other possibility is I could answer what about if omega is not badly approximable? That might fit better in the time. Do people have a preference? You can type it into the chat window. We might break the chat window. 
students, okay. Four minutes, I think, all right. <laughs> Thanks for what, keep watching my back. <laughs> all right, so let me talk about what we did with the students. So this is gonna be warp speed, all right? So uh, fasten your seat belts. Um, so for any T bigger than zero, <laughs> yeah, I owe you a dollar. Hey, Tushar, how are you doing? Uh, so <laughs> anyway, uh, so good, for any T bigger you're than- You're doing brilliantly. You're doing, you're doing a beautiful job. Yeah. Thank you. At least Tushar is doing a beautiful job getting me the extra five minutes. Uh, all right, so um, you have the uh, number of integer points in M of T minus one gaps, okay? But if you have a badly approximable vector, you have finitely many, a uniform bounded number of uh, different gap lengths. So the question is, these huge number of gaps delta i of t, they're balanced between this uniform number of gap lengths. So the question is, how, do the, how are they distributed? What frequencies do they have? So let's let pj be the proportion of the gaps of the form delta i of t that have length delta j of t. It's easier to just say, P1 of t is the number of the proportion of gaps that are shortest. P2 of t is the proportion of gaps that are second shortest, et cetera. So the sum of the frequencies is one, of course, because everything is of some length, and each of them is greater than or equal to zero. The big problem, and I, I think this is a tremendously big problem and extremely interesting and important, is how does this vector of proportions of gaps of smallest, second smallest, third smallest, et cetera, length, evolve with t as t goes to infinity? That's the question. And this honestly is quite open um, that with the high school students and then with a collaborator just this year, we've made some progress on a very specific case of it. Um, I think this is a great problem that's well worth studying. So let me give you an illustration. Here's the one dimensional case, alpha square root of two. And if you just start doing this, so one is the number of gaps of the shortest length, two is the number of gaps of the second shortest length, three is the number of gaps of the third shortest length. You start doing this and you see you have these histograms evolving with the number of points. I realize I'm going fast, but does everybody understand what's happening here? So as I add a point on the circle, the distribution between the uh, gap sizes changes and something really funny happens. Watch these last ones. We've got lots of the longest gap here. And every time you add a point, one of those disappears and it gets split into the smallest and second smallest. You guys see that? So every time a point is added, it splits the biggest to the smallest and second smallest. So it's extremely regular what happens in the one dimensional case. So uh, as uh, Hugo Steinhaus would say, it's for kids. What's not for kids, of course kids are great, what's not for kids is the higher dimensional version. So here we start adding some points and this is this cube root of two, cube root of four situation. You're getting more and more spacing, different spacing lengths. And they're kind of evolving in some way that's hard to, hard to understand. I mean, it's, this is just supposed to give you an idea what the problem is, but it's very difficult. So if I have, do I have two minutes? Yeah. Is that begrudging two minutes? All right. <laughs> Thanks. No, it's good. I promise, I promise. All right, so I've got to tell you a little bit of what a number theory is, but it's extremely short. An algebraic number field is a finite extension of Q, and you can suppose it's contained in the complex numbers. Think Q adjoin cube root of two. That's our favorite example. That's a degree three extension. Perron's theorem from 1921 tells you that if one omega one through omega d form a basis for your algebraic number field, then omega one through omega d is a badly approximable vector. So now we actually know how to make lots of badly approximable vectors. There are badly approximable vectors that aren't of this form, but this is some way to make them, okay? For example, one cube root of two cube root of four forms a basis for Q adjoin cube root of two. And so cube root of two cube root of four is a badly approximable vector. Right. So that's the one we've been using. And you can actually explicitly compute I think Jacob was asking how to compute these things. You can actually explicitly compute that Perron's theorem gives you this constant. All right, an algebraic integer is a solution to a monic integer polynomial. So um, that's just a definition. Um, it's like a generalization of the classical integers. And the set of algebraic integers forms a sub ring of the field, of the number field. The invertible elements are called the group of units. Think plus or minus one or 
groups of unity in the complex plane. I just need this to say that there is a number r, the group of units always, is always of the form z to the r times a finite group. R is called the, um, r is called the rank of the unit group, and that's what I need for the statements, okay? So here's theorem one. This is from 2009 through 2011. Uh, Yoko Homa, Lyndon G, and Jeffrey Shen were working with Pavel Blaher and myself. Um, and we require that the unit group has rank one. That means it implies that phi is a cubic extension and that d is two. But two is bigger than one, and one is for kids, so two is for grown-ups. All right, here I'm just gonna tell you two theorems that they proved and show you a picture of them and then we're basically done. So the first theorem is that under these hypotheses, uh, rank one basis, then there's a finite set, a uniform finite subset of the field, so that for any t greater than zero, there is a unit so that you can rescale every gap length as some element of your uniform set times that unit. So there's a uniform way of labeling your gap lengths by this finite set S, and then every actual gap length is just a rescaling of that finite set. So it's a uniform labeling. This isn't a labeling by smallest, second smallest, third smallest. I wish it were. If it were, we'd have an amazing theorem. But it's some labeling, so we're rephrasing the problem slightly. We say that gap length delta i normalizes to sj if delta i is this scaling unit, this preferred unit times little sj. So it's some sort of algebraic number theory way of labeling the spacings instead of by length. It's closely related to by length, but it's not exactly the same. So here is the big theorem. These are the proportions that I was talking about before, but they're not labeled by the smallest, second smallest, third smallest, they're labeled by the elements of S. And then we can determine the time behavior. And the statement is that the time behavior, the proportions of the, sp the, proportions of the spacings that are normalized to S1, to S2 through Sj, they're determined there's an explicit function g from the, this is a cylinder, cylinder, there's an explicit function g from the cylinder to the space of proportions, and you evaluate that function at theta log t, beta log t mod one, and that gives you the proportions of the spacings up to a small error term. So that's a lot to, that's a lot to absorb, but the point is we have an extremely explicit way of describing the proportions. And um, it's best to just look at this. Here is the cylinder. This is this cylinder here. This is this cylinder. And you've got a linear flow on the cylinder. Linear flows are easy. People from dynamical systems think that they're too easy. You have a linear flow on the cylinder in log t time, but it's a linear flow on the cylinder. It's the simplest thing in the world. You have an explicit function g from the cylinder. You eat this linear flow on the cylinder with g and that gives you your proportions. So that's the theorem. And it's not quite smallest, second smallest, third smallest, and if you could do that, I'd be very, very happy. Um, but that's the best, you can, best we can do. Uh, Jeffrey, Yoko, and Lyndon got first place in the National Siemens competition for their work. Uh, here you see their prize. Um, they've moved on to greener pastures. And I know I'm over time, but let me add one footnote. For years, I've wanted to get rid of the hypothesis that the rank is one. And this year, under pandemic lockdown, Alan Haynes and I have removed the hypothesis. And our work relies very heavily upon the work of uh, Yoko, Jeffrey, and Lyndon. Um, several of the aspects of their proof generalized perfectly. There was one or maybe two spots we were stuck. And 10 years later, Alan and I got it. So. Well, congratulations on your wonderful research. Uh, thanks for your patience with my long talk. Uh, it's been so much fun. And if you want to read more, you can look at these papers and the references therein, or just email me and I'm happy to discuss. So thanks again.